do you have the time to listen to me whine? God. Welcome to the Smart Nonsense Podcast, where we talk about entrepreneurship, self-development, and challenging norms. Today, we are on to episode 63. And That's we're doing crazy. A, a book club, a crazy book club on deep work. Rules for Focus, Success, in a Distracted World by Cal Newport. Seven hours and 44 minutes on audio. Coming in at seven hours and 44 minutes. I love to minutes. see that. Anytime it's sub eight, I'm like, I'm I, pu- I pumped it up to 3.4x speed. I heard too. you. You're, you're out uh, hammering things and, and <laughs> drilling to China. I don't know what you're doing up there, but I heard your audible in the background. We're dialing it in. People should watch us on YouTube, right, before we talk about the book. <clears throat> Gotta give them the call to action. The set's looking better. We're getting lights. I mean... Pretty soon, this is going to be unstoppable. I, I might look stupid. I've been running around, but yeah, you look. I feel like you I look, have like a. I don't want to say the term, <laughs> but you can look. Your, beat. Can I see the monitor? Yeah, yeah. Look at the monitor. Look bring how beat you bit, look. Bring it a little bit closer. Tell them who who should read Deep Work. Well, here's the thing Other about Deep Work, right? We're living in the 21st century. Oh, we are in. You don't listen, so I'll talk to the camera. I'm listening. We are in the information age, not this industrial age like back in the day, and back then. I can't stand you looking at yourself. Back then, everything was just productivity. Like, how productive can you be? But now it's, it's shifting. And David Perel has that quote. It's like, industrial age, that's when it was all about hard work. We're in the information age. Yes. Now it's all about obsession. Mm. And obsession in the Cal Newport sense because, is... Because, sorry, before we get to Cal Newport, you want to say it? Deep work. Ah. <sighs> Could not go without that. The infra information age being like things now are more easily accessible the world is flatter than it's ever been ever and we're at this point where like you can first of all a lot of things you do can be easily replicated by a high school student a college student um they can in a lot of ways be taken into account by artificial intelligence or googling things that's the information age at least as i understood it it's just so much of it and if you're just doing that stuff the, You're gone. Okay, it's, it's like uh, two sides of the coin, right? You have this global world, all this information, all this technology that is just making the silly work, the uh, surf, surf, uh, what's shallow, it? shallow, shallow, shallow work. Term. Shallow work. That's just going to the wayside. So we got to figure out our advantage in the world is depth. That's where we can go. And it's just focusing on one thing for several hours, at least an hour at a time. No distractions. This is you just crushing it. That's kind of what I do with these and book clubs. What I, what I was just looking up is depth, meaning one, mastering really hard things, and then two, producing at an elite level. That's what you get from depth. And you're not going to do that from a, a state of just working, but emails in the background, Facebook's there, Text you, you're messages, getting notifications. Things, right. There's a lot of good stuff. Where do you want to go with it? Well, one. I want to clear up. First, we'll go with what is deep work. We kind of already clarified that. Why is it important? We talked a little bit about that. And then lastly, like how can people really embrace it in Mm. their lives to take advantage of it? Because it's so rare now. Like we used to have like the Walden type authors or whatever that go in the woods and and just sit by themselves and just write and create. Right. And we need to start to replicate that. J.K. Rowling did at one point in in this book. Um, That was cool, actually, because... There was a couple examples of people using deep work in their day-to-day life, and it's just, uh, there are different ways of doing it, but J.K. Rowling rented a hotel, five-star hotel, yeah. she had some money, but like, just sits and creates and creates and creates in that environment that's suitable for her. There are different ways, like, you can do that. There's another guy that bought There's, a flight to by, Tokyo. By the way, flight to Tokyo, sure. Um, you don't have to go to a five-star hotel to do that. It's, it's more about, I think they called it the grand gesture, but it's about, like, getting out of your day-to-day routine. Maybe you go work at a new coffee shop today and having that new um, environment like stokes the motivation within you to keep going. I, I want to clarify though, there is like, you don't want to change the environment every time necessarily. That's probably not good because right. they want to make it like a habit because I guess we'll get into it, but there's um, the routine aspect. Like if you're changing environments, you're not going to have that instinctual like you just do. Um, too many people are like, oh, I recognize deep work is important, but they just don't do it because they don't set up the environment right. They don't have the routine. Oh, yeah. That, so that was interesting. It's um, kind of lays out the three vignettes 
three people that are really good deep workers in chapter one. And the inverse of those three people, it was like Nate Silver, John Doer of Liner Perkins, uh, I forget, the guy who wrote Ruby on Rails. Um, and then the antithesis to those people was, well, what about Jack Dorsey? Because he's, you know, running around, really scattered. He had Twitter and then he went and founded Square. Um, and the author was like, don't use the Jack Dorsey example as like a means for why your shallow work is okay right you're like oh well jack dorsey did it so like i I can continue being shallow they basically say jack dorsey can do that because he has everyone else doing the deep work for him and they're just aggregating it right it's literally his job as an executive to be bouncing around he can't possibly sit down for six hours at a meeting um and indulge in the deep deep work of doing that he has to be in order for those those things to run like that's just what he has to do that's what's funny to me too is like well one bill gates like at the beginning i think at the beginning when you're the actual creator that's when you need the deep work but when you're more so the manager uh, you don't need quite as much of it i think no and i think it'd be a detriment too if like everyone's looking for you to manage the company and you're like i'm sorry i need to write this novel or if it's related like if steve jobs was like i just need to make this one iphone like no he was doing a bunch of other stuff yeah i think that's where there are different ways of going about it people in different scenarios like maybe they have a boss and like the boss is like hey you got to be on call 24 7 there's this this set of like just have expectations like i'll be on call for this amount of time but then the rest is like that's my deep work period Mm -hmm. and like you can't go to a boss or you could go to a boss and be like hey, I don't want to do 100% shallow work. I don't think that's in your best interest. So let's set up an arrangement where this can work. I think that's because people don't know what shallow work is, right? It's like people think you show up to work, you answer emails all day. Even better, you forward emails to peers and just say thoughts, question mark. Um, You know, you're instantly replying to things on Slack and your text messages. I don't think people realize how shallow that is and you feel fulfilled because you were doing things all day long right can i talk to you for a second about how many trips to menard you're making oh i don't even even know the name of it but you're there every day at least three times a day why is that it it, it's not deep work related it's so shallow i like it's shallow a hundred percent thing it's a hundred percent shallow that's why i try and like all that shopping right for the van when i ordered like big materials for this i make sure i go online And I pay the $80 to have it delivered here to the door. Because when I was like working with my dad on a project and we spent two hours in Menards, I'm like, well, $100 an hour here, $100 an hour there. It's bad news. That's been your life the last couple of days. Here's, Here's what you have to do when it comes to building things. And this is what Adam Savage sets out to do. You need to have your, your studio and your workshop needs to just be a mini hardware store in and of itself. So that when it's late on a Tuesday like today, like you don't have to run to Menards. You just hit the cabinet and that's where we're getting. But it is really shallow. A lot of shallow work. I think a cool point, I sent this article to you yesterday about the yes, reason why. I skimmed. Paul Graham? Paul Graham. Yeah, it's called The Lesson to Unlearn. Mm. And it's basically talking about the vestiges of the industrial age where people will just look for busyness. Busyness is the, the test, the metric of how productive how much you're contributing to the company and we've talked about it that was a point in the world where y- you could work you could be worth nothing work as hard as you want and be upper middle class that was just fact of the matter like input equaled output and output was really good benefits good pay good unions it was all those things information age that's not true anymore yeah so you get people that just want i mean i used to do this at my restaurant it was like if you weren't looking busy they'd tell you to clean shit and i'm like i don't want to clean so I just run away. I would run and hide in the ice room. It was hilarious. We'd go and like throw ice at each other in the ice room just to not be near the boss. But that's the case. It's just like the test is how busy do you look? People replying all to their email, like pretending that they're doing stuff, but that's not actually getting anything done. And the problem that Paul Graham says is when you have authorities making these tests. So these tests being like, oh, I'm going to look as the metric how much stuff are you, are you like saying or doing, whatever. But that doesn't quantify the, the depth, the quality of the work. So 
So what 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 has to happen there? Like, well, one the new wave of authority figures has to be people our age that are more in tune with, like. I think there has to be one more of a discussion and of like, hey, uh, let's talk about the metrics that matter. I think that's more of a we'll get into it. There are like four steps to really okay do this, but identifying the deep work. Like you got to do an eighty twenty, and maybe talk to your boss about it. If it's your own company, it's super easy. But just figure out where is the net benefit. Like what do you want to accomplish? And eighty twenty means like eighty percent of the results that you're looking for will come from twenty percent of whatever the input is. Right. So a lot of people spending time on email that's not going to contribute. That's just superfluous stuff. Um, I think it's just connecting people with the metrics that you care about. So for example, right now. With our YouTube team, I'm like, um, we don't care enough about subscribers. Probably it's all my fault because we don't emphasize enough. But like, hey, Erica, you're working on video. YouTube, all I care about is subscribers. And like, that's not the perfect test, but that's closer than just like, I want you to do a lot of videos. Oh, right. So it's a little bit of that responsibility and just like, you want the market to be the metric, not the, the person the authority administering the test like i see i would be i see but basically like come back to me and let's check off all these things you did yeah i don't want a checklist of stuff you've done i want like hey i'm just gonna look at this metric zuckerberg had this with i think it was growth so like users at facebook everything would just be i want to do this is this going to increase growth or not and if it does sure try it and from my skimming of the Paul Graham piece when he was talking about like grades and tests. It's like tests don't, from the authority figure, like they don't test your knowledge on, what was the example he used? Medieval warfare or something. Um, They train you to like look for chunks of questioning in the readings that could in turn come up as questions and like it totally messes up your, like I, I remember all the way through high school you would read and you could tell like what sentence would be turned into a, a mm. what's it called? A, a test question. question. Yeah. And like, how shallow is that? Right. He says, I mean, that was the reason why Paul Graham didn't like school. He's a Y Combinator. Founder. Right. But uh, he said it because it was just these hackable tests in the workplace. It's hackable by just responding to a lot of emails, right. pretending to do shit. Um, so you want to make it unhackable as much as possible. Wait, All you right. mentioned Zuckerberg really quick because he talks a lot about how, um, like inadequate open office, the big Facebook warehouse open office workspace right. in terms of like distractions. And I was there and it's like, it's like a little micro city. You know, you bump into some, they, they, they write it off as serendipity. They want you to, especially at Twitter, run into somebody and learn something new from a developer or from whoever. But instead it's like chit chat, wasted time, time spent at the coffee and i think that's changing a lot now people are realizing like maybe i'm not working eight hours a day but i'm at home i don't have to commute and i'm not like gossiping at the water cooler and instead in turn i'm doing six and a half hours of really deep work and i feel more more fulfilled because of that if you do it right unless you have your slack open like you gotta have the do not disturb i think what was interesting two different uh studies basically one was mit and you remember the long hallway Mm, remind me so basically mit was super prolific i think it was i don't want to say it was like post-war maybe it was like the 50s to the 70s i forget exactly when that era was but they had everyone had their own room so you could go and do your deep work but then there was this long hallway it it literally converged like uh to the horizon (laughs) like okay it just went forever thought experiment no this was five rooms of this was a real place. Something that else. was uh, an architect okay. and different okay. thing. But basically, like, to get to your office, you had to walk down this hallway. And since everyone, they have to go through the same hallway, there's a lot of these collisions, these serendipitous little interactions. And it just created this prolific period in terms of inventions coming out of that MIT hmm. lab. And that's basically what Cal Newport says should be the model. It's this model of, like, you have the spokes where you can go into your little room, but you have the hub in the middle. And the hub is going to be your little meeting place. Like you can go have lunch, chit chat, whatever. But you can also go back into your little spoke office and just do the deep work for your nobody's bothering you. Hour, two hours, hmm. exactly. So that's the ideal office in his world. Um, but let's okay. Let's go through 
how people can really start to implement deep work because it's such an advantage. Like I know that when I'm in this flow state and it's like everyone's trying to go for flow, basically that's what deep work is um, in this sense. As long as it's flow in the right direction, you can have it with video games. That's why they're so successful. You want to channel your flow towards one task. That's where you come in 80-20. Like what is going to work for us? I've decided like Twitter because that's where basically we want growth, right? So Twitter is going to get us the guess and then YouTube is going to help with spreading the message. So basically any activities that go towards that, any deep activities that go towards that is going to be the most mm-hmm. beneficial. Uh, <clears throat> but there are a lot of like fake tools that they have. So like you could say, oh, what about Facebook? For example, there are plenty of people there. Like, why aren't you reposting this on Instagram and Facebook, et cetera? But you got to realize it's like the gains are going to be marginal. Right. The 80-20 is so fundamental. It, exactly. It's, if it's going to take 50% of your time to post on Facebook and Instagram and you're going to get 3% gain for doing so, it's like stop and double down on the thing that's 80-20. They had this, uh, they had a couple of examples. One was an author that was responding to emails and he's like, well, it's going to help with sales, but it's like all these one-off things. Maybe the 200 people you responded to are going to buy, but that's $2,000. Right. Like it'd be much better opportunity cost wise to just write, create more, create better work. That's going to get shared. Michael Lewis and Malcolm Gladwell too were noted in the book for not having Twitter because of that. Mm. Like, well, if I respond to all these things and respond to all these emails and I give that stuff out, that's less time I can spend, spend writing books or less book writing energy than I'm giving up. I like the, you remember the farmer? The mm-hmm. farmer is, uh, basically farms are like the, the family farms are just going to the wayside for these factory farms. But this one guy was succeeding and it's like, why are you being successful? It's like, well, you look at all the farms that are failing and you see that, oh, they have all this grass, right? They have big farms. The grass dies and they use that. They make their own hay. And that's like the animal feed or whatever. But he's like, what you have to realize is when you're making your own hay, you have to buy the hay bale, you have to buy the garage to store it. There's all these maintenance costs. You have the opportunity costs of creating the hay. I just screw that. I'm just going to buy my own hay. And then that's going to just help me focus on what I'm best at. Hmm. And that's why he's been able to to succeed in his little market. It's just like a... so interesting. A micro example. I uh, once, when I was driving Route 66 with my dad, I we saw all this hay bailed up. I was like, "Why are people doing that? It must be worth a lot of money." It kind of is. It's like two fifty a bale, depending on the grade of your. But price. everything eighty twenty and opportunity cost. That's the thing. You got to realize, like every second you spend making this hay, you could just buy it and then focus on growing. Oh well, they were selling it. The ones that bailed it up. Yeah, maybe they're selling to this guy. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's that's step one. Is like really realize what you should be working on. Step two is like, how do you make this a routine in your life? Because everyone's like, oh yeah, deep work, recognize it. I'll make time for it at some point. Mm-hmm. And then what it happens once a month, maybe. So you got to go back to the power of habit yes. and figure out, well, what is going to be the cue? What's my routine? Well, routine is just deep work without distractions. And then reward. Maybe it's like you created something by the end. Maybe you give yourself a little candy or I don't know what you want to do. There, so there are two things that come. I don't know what you want to do. There are two things that come to mind here. Um, uh, one is the we're oh, recording okay, this no, really I late. I That's why both you can't think. I know. No, what I need to do, we need a coffee maker. We need our smart nonsense mugs, and I just need to be pounding coffee because when I'm caffeinated, True. the words just bleh. <laughs> um, two things. I just had it. Now it's gone. Habits. The thing with deep work. It's not something that you can schedule in for like 30 minutes a day, he says. You need to be like, it's, it's, it's a full day thing. You need to say, okay, three days this week are deep work and two or, or three are open work or whatever. The other one that was kind of interesting was, I think Seinfeld did it, the chain method. Hmm. It's, it's, it's power of habit. It's kind of like what I do with my little morning work. Exactly. exactly. He would like write a, a, a joke on a whiteboard every day without erasing the previous ones. And you start to see that build up and gain its momentum. And then, you know, two weeks down the line, you're like, oh, that, yeah, he had a something. legit calendar. And you say yeah. he writes a joke, you do a big red X. Yeah. And so you just see all these X's piling up. For me, it's seeing, I save all my highlights from the day uh, in my Instagram stories, which I'm going to get rid of Instagram. We'll talk about that. But 
it's beneficial for seeing like, oh, I've almost, I'm almost at a hundred days straight of this habit. So do the same. Like for me, I think I got to figure out exactly if it's going to be like breakfast at wherever we're living. Like right after I eat breakfast, I just go into deep work. I lock myself <laughs> in a room. Yeah, I'm curious whatever. what you do. What time do you wake up these days? I woke up at like 10 45. Oh. Kind of late. Normally it's like 10, but either at home or here at some point there's deep work. I can get in that flow state. And what they usually say is like 90 minutes. That's, oh. that's the ideal time, at least. Of Before this. taking a break, for sure. Yeah, I mean, some people, it's going to be hard in the beginning because everyone, like, that's what Cal says is like, if, if you can't stand and just like look at the sky for five minutes without freaking out and going on your phone, which I can't, I always think I have to be listening to something, something. consuming something, which is bad. But you have to be okay with boredom. To yeah. really be able to do this successfully, you have to get to that level. One thing I really want to try when it's safe to do so again is um, salt bath. Uh, what's it called? Oh, Sensory deprivation. I want to do that so bad. The little for, tanks. Yes. Mm. I think it was in Tools of Titans. I just spit all over the mic. Um, Tim Ferriss. But like for an hour. Sensory deprivation. Right? Room's black. Water is the same temperature as the air. And you're just floating on your back. I think that's the ultimate test. I, I also think I would go crazy after like eight minutes. Anxiety I've been thinking wise. about that for so long. One of my friends just did it, and he was like, dude, like, crazy. I think t- Tim Ferriss said it was, like, on the order of, like, psilocybin hallucination type stuff. Or, or like, mental awakening type stuff, which is pretty cool. That's why they say, like, do that. Like, don't have these distractions in place. That's so fundamental. Is If you can take away all the little pings. We talked about this in, what was the last episode on The Social Dilemma? a couple episodes Mm. back. Uh, It's basically everything's calling for attention constantly. So you have to be able to either put your phone on airplane mode, do not disturb. Put in another room. Another room. Downstairs if you can. Completely. You would be shocked at how easy it is to forget about it and how how much easier it is to go in to flow if your phone is just like more than three feet away from you. Oh, true. That's what I wanted to say too is there's this concept of like reducing friction to build a habit. Oh, right. well, if you want to get rid of a habit, add friction. So that means, yeah, literally like... Talk about your little, your little candies uh, at, at your mom's place. Oh, You're trying just, to eat them all. Yeah, yeah. My mom would come and like make some brownies or just buy some candies. And I'm like, mom, I'm going to throw them out unless you hide them. And so they'd be somewhere in some cupboard somewhere. And then we just couldn't find them or it'd be like super tricky. That's why I hide apps. Right now, I, I just mm. hit Instagram on my phone. I find it super fast still. But <laughs> Searches it's like, it? If you add a little bit of friction, as long as it's like eight seconds, you're yeah. going to like be like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm it's all about the nudge. Wasting. Like you said, in both ways. If you want someone to do something, just nudge them like right in front of their face. Reduce the friction and go the other way. Hide something. If That's why... It's all... It's, it's, it's reptilian... It's like limbic brain stuff. You know, if you really love yogurt and you have this habit of getting a yogurt out of the fridge at 1 p.m. every day and you go and you see the strawberry yogurt... Like, you're going to start drooling. It's Pavlovian. It happens to me with ice cream every single night. I'm like, oh, it's 9 p.m. I'm not really doing anything. Ice cream. And it's all limbic stuff. You can't control it. You got to increase the friction. I know. The friction would be stop buying ice cream, but. I know. Luckily, um, I'm just too lazy to buy things. So I'm running out of food. I'm That's like, friction. I'm just drinking That's tea instead. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think another one connected is like when you're going to do this, you have to definitely set the expectations like we talked about before. With yourself, telling people or, around okay, you, yeah. like, hey, this is my deep work period. I'm just not excessive. This comes oh, with like... Oh, I love that. Feynman saying he was, he was like, oh, I'm irresponsible. Yeah. You, don't, you don't want me to do that engagement. I'm irresponsible. I love that. Yeah, he said that in... Um, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. Just read that there. Okay. And yeah, it's like, I don't want to do all this stuff. So I just tell him... I'm, like, I, I pretend to be a clown, so they're just like, we can't have this guy. Like, he's insane. Yeah. And I've just kind of, for the first time, I was like a yes man for 22 years. And then I, it came, became a point where I was spread thin. And now I say no to a lot of things, but I kind of want to be like, I'm just, I'm irresponsible. Like, you don't, you, I promise you, you do not want me to videotape this thing for you. I'm irresponsible. It could work. I mean, clearly it has. Fineman. There's, like, you have your little email autoresponder. Tim Ferriss mm-hmm. is big on this. One quote that... Cal mentioned that I've heard before too is you have to be okay with letting small bad things happen. 
all the time. Like someone tries to reach out to you and like my, my phone won't buzz or whatever. They're going to get mad. But like at the end of the day, no one's going to die. If someone's going to die, you will get a call. Yes. People will find a way to get to you, but add that friction for them. So that it's not like the, the case of email spam back in the nineties and you could just send it to anyone without any cost. Right. And you're expected to respond immediately. It happens to me with weddings all the time. It's like people want and need things all the time. They're stressed out. I get it. Um, rarely do people go beyond my autoresponder and text me that things are urgent. It happened today and it was urgent and we took care of it. But like, you got to let all the small bad stuff go. Yeah, I think that's literally just expectations up front. People like it. I remember Jason Freed, it, it quotes him with, uh, uh, I forget the original name of the company, but it's Basecamp now. And they're like, you know it what? It's like 37 things or 37 something? studios or something? 37, 37 something. Mm, I forget. It might have actually been 37 something. I don't think so. Uh, it doesn't matter. 37, whatever it is. But basically, he's like, hey, I know for a fact, like, people are just pretending to be busy. We don't need this much time for deep quality work. So he actually mm. took an, an entire day out of each week and just canceled it. And then I think it was the New York Times was like, hey, like, um, you can't make people work 10 hours a day, four days a week, and like, they're, they're not going to be productive. And he's like, no, it's still eight hours. We just don't need 40 hours a week. Yeah. They get more work done in the 32 hours. Right. Because you're focused, you know, that's your time to work. And then if you have it chunked off, like it's in your schedule, and there's like a time limit, you know you're just going right. to have that Parkinson's law. Exactly. That was the other thing. Making micro deadlines, if you only have 32 hours in the office in a week because every Friday's off, it's like, you will start cutting out the bullshit. You'll stop responding immediately to those emails. It'll just happen because it has to happen. And that's Parkinson's law. He also even had the whole company take a month off just to work yeah. on a project and come back and present them. Just like cool no personal stuff. Just wasn't it like, well, it was, yeah, it? it was both. It was like, just take a break. But like, ideally you're thinking about like, you're yeah. kind of getting bored, lost in the woods and just like think of cool stuff. And that's where creativity comes from. That was a big issue with quarantine is like, everyone's worried that without these little collisions of serendipity, we're not going to have the creativity and that is an issue, but you just make time for that and the rest you can be alone. The introvert. Out. So I think uh, once Wasn't you really fourth point shutting down, oh. as in you have your time, like we just said with the schedule, right when you're done, you have your little closing, like close any loops that there are like, so you're not like leaving just with work half finished. You want to have a plan for like, all right, I'm, this is how I'm going to finish it tomorrow. But you close your laptop, you close whatever, and you're done. And he says, like, maybe you even say something like, I'm, I'm shutting down now. Right. And it, two things happened to me when I heard that. It's one, I realized why I think so many people can be happy working nine to five is because 5 p.m. hits, they clock out, they have this shutdown put in place for them, and they're free to enjoy the evening. And... I think as someone who can work 24 hours, like you're self-employed, you're grinding, whatever, you never get that. And it's funny because last night I was working till about 1030. Before reading this, I read this this morning and I was like, all right, I'm done now. And I closed my, I, I said that I, out loud. I said it too. I, I said, said it out loud <laughs> before hearing this. Um, I was like, okay, I'm done now. Oh, before hearing Before it. hearing this. So Look that's why it was kind of serendipitous. And so I closed my laptop and then I was like, all right. And I watched stupid TV for an hour. It's really important. It's so hard. It's so hard. Really important. It's so hard. That's why. You know I, what I like actually this. worked really well for me in, in college was, again, didn't know about the shutdown thing, but I'm I worked I worked out at nine p.m. or ten p.m. I just worked out at the end of every night, so I knew when my work was done. I went to the gym, and I worked out, and that was like the release of all. That was the shutting down. Mm. That's super important. It's your little ritual. Exactly. I think. Well, that was funny because in college. I've heard it multiple times from multiple different people I lived with. They're like, Dylan, I've never seen you work. Like, literally, sometimes... I've never seen you shut down. I, you know, like, 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 physically shut yourself down. Like, I've seen you work at 4 a.m. Right. Well, I'd be, like, just fucking around, like, the whole day, okay. just playing sports in the yard and, like, just watching TV shows and stuff for the entire day. But then from, like, midnight or 1 a.m. till 4 a.m., that's just my little flow Whoa, state. Right. And no one sees that. But like, I can't go to the library because it's like the hub. There are just right. too many distractions going on. I know people just doing light, the 
the superficial. I keep the shallow work. Shallow. They keep doing shallow work and they're like, oh, I clocked in 10 hours in. Shallow, shallow. In the, so what do you say to all those people that say you don't work? You do? Just look at the results. That's actually, I just Were looked. You, okay. The Were, metric black hole that okay. gets into why this all happens is like you can't measure your output in a normal job. I miss that. Is that in the book? What? The metric black hole? Or is that something yeah, else? Yeah, that's, that's why it talks about like there's no good metric for judging the quality of people's work or at least they don't mm. put enough time into it. So the metric is like, oh, how many emails did you yeah, respond it's, to Yeah, it's today? like status almost. It's like, do you appear like you're always available to your colleagues? That becomes the only metric you have. It's like, yes, I answered things immediately. Yes, I answered 150 emails today. Yes, my Slack always shows that that green dot, I'm online available. Those are the metrics. That's dangerous. I want to mention with email a couple of cool things and we'll start wrapping up. One can't tell them we're wrapping up then they're gonna wrap up we're not wrapping up we'll never wrap up <laughs> this goes on forever there's no 24 hour shutdown. filibuster <laughs> podcast <laughs> fuck so the first one there are three different approaches here with email the first one is just making the onus to do the work oh, on the sender yes like you don't want that email like hey are you free to meet this week yeah like no give me like you want an email that comes in and it's like, hey, I'm working on this project. This is how I think it's connected to what you're doing. I like it. I'd love to meet this week. Here's when I'm free to do any of these dates work for you. You want something like that coming yes. into your inbox. And then it's just super easy. No friction on the reply. How do you get side. that? How do you get someone to come into your inbox? I think what he said is you have to be okay just not responding to things. Well, one that ideally you can kind of warn people ahead of time. And I know Tim Ferriss, he has like this whole FAQ that is uh, an autoresponder. So people will send you something and the FAQ link comes up or whatever. And it's like, mm. hey, I'm not going to respond if it's this, this, this. Send it to this person if you want this response. Like, it's just very clear what he's going to respond to and what he's not. And I think there was an example with Cal, I believe, but someone was reaching out and he said he, like, he doesn't respond to these types of messages often. So they weren't expecting okay. a response. And then when it did get one, it was like, oh, pleasant surprise. Better. Everything's expectations there. But it's big, too, because it's hard for me. Like, not everything needs a response. It just doesn't. Like, you see me, I react to, like, every single text message. You know, like, people joke about that. Um, you kind of have to, like, let go of, of pleasing people. In trying to please everybody, you will please nobody. That's the proverbial thing. You, you can't just respond to everything. Gotta let them. Like, there are some people I know. I'm, I mean, that's today is, like, you go, uh, you're texting someone that you just met. I'm talking about dating in particular, and they'll just ghost you. Yeah, right. And it's just like, that's, that's the way the world works. So yeah. I think people are more that's used to it and more okay with it. I don't get ghosted <laughs> ever. They're like, Dylan, please, come on. I'm just, I'm the ghost. But the, the second one is basically what, once you get an email, like try and close the loop. So don't have these open loops, this little ping pong of uh, like email tennis where you just send back the minimum response just to get it off your plate and then just balls Thoughts? in their court. Mm. You want to like do the whole decision tree. Mm -hmm. Like if they respond this, what, what's going to be the action? If they respond that, what's going to be the action? Um, so there are a bunch of examples, but like someone asks for your feedback, be like, oh, here's how I'm going to give the feedback. I'm going to do the X, Y, and Z. If you don't understand it, look at these resources, whatever. There's no need to reply to this. And like loop <laughs> is closed. Close the circuit. So just take that extra like two minutes to think through yeah. what their possible response is. Like game theory. That's smart. And then you don't have to worry about that email ever again. Systems. No code. You can tell Belky is tired. No, I love it. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything. I I'm curious about how hey, what are we're going to implement it more. I think, I think I'm going to... I'm going to do this verbal shutdown. Mm. I don't know when. I'm going to do it. Yeah, I have this problem of constantly listening. To, I, I don't know how I'm going to get over that. I think I generally, I so it's like I read and consume and podcast and like do the whole gamut all day long. And then when I shut down, I just like go on YouTube. Mm. But when I'm on YouTube, I don't watch stuff that is like self and job related. I only watch the goofy entertainment stuff. That's so hard for me. It's so, well, I'm definitely, I know what are your hobbies. 
and I don't have hobbies. <laughs> I, I lost. I have no sports anymore. I got to find something to do. Uh, this I is just my hobby. Some. But I think taking away Instagram Why don't you ride Facebook, your bike around? Why don't they're you... sending me a pedal. Yes. The Super you 73. don't need the pedal. <laughs> I hope they're <laughs> sending you a okay. okay. pedal. Never ride that thing. <laughs> All right. God, no one knows what we're talking about. But uh, yeah, I really want to just figure out when that routine is going to be. Maybe it's in the morning. But like literally, there's the Freedom app. People use that sometimes. Or just put your phone and your computer out. Just work with like a pen and paper oh, like I'm doing right now. There's just a lot of ways to eliminate distractions. So Freedom app runs a VPN to block apps, right? I don't know the technology, but basically like... <laughs> Clearly you, hasn't used it. No, no, I have. Like you, you just can't go on these. Okay, It'll just okay that's it. what it does. Yeah. So we're talking about that for Dunbar is when you're with people, do we do something mm. like that? You run the VPN block. And just lock them down. X them out. So that's the gist is like, okay, hey, this is important. No one's doing deep work these days. So if you can, you'll stand out. You'll be the little craftsman that is just creating masterpieces because you can put 90 minutes in. Peter Drucker, I don't think I mentioned that, but he has the effective executive. That's, that's what would happen. You just have your chunk. No one can interrupt you. And then you emerge and then anyone can talk to you. That's fine. But just have your periods where you go and, and crush it. Oh, 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 oh,